عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين My dear friends worldwide السلام عليكم ورحمة الله May you have beautiful days and nights uh, during this blessed month of Ramadan inshallah I pray that you enjoy, enjoy the supplications, the Quranic recitation, the Islamic lectures, and also interacting with your uh, family members during this month. Our Lord states in chapter 21, Surah Al-Anbiya, the Prophets, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, إن هذه أمتكم أمة واحدة وأنا ربكم فاعبدون صدق الله العلي العظيم Indeed, this community is one community. God mentions this verse after, after rehearsing the name of 25 different messengers and prophets. Almost all of them are biblical. Jewish prophets, biblical prophets. He enumerate their names, one after the other, 25 names. At the end, he comes to this conclusion. Inna hadihi ummatukum. Verily, this nation, referring to many prophets who came at different historic times, they were not all together during one time or one location. They came over many centuries. Many centuries separate between them. But God yet says, you are one family. You are one ummah, one community. Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahida, unified community. And I am your Lord, therefore worship me. Tonight, my friends, I want to share with you four important critical points in our interaction with others. What I mean by others are the non-Muslims. How do we interact with them? What are the best ways of interacting with them? And we know that our religion, our faith, encourages us to reach out to others, to reach out to all mankind, Muslims and non-Muslims, to build bridges, of understanding with other communities, bridges of friendship and affection. And this relationship should be based on honesty, based on uh, truth, based on love and mutual respect, not based on discrimination or bias or hate or racism. This would not help us, believe me. Today we need, more than any other time, we need to work together. We need to understand each other. We need to respect each other. We need to shun off bigotry, racism, superiority. We need to save this earth. We have enough pain, enough suffering in this earth. So we, the followers of religions, should reach out to each other and understand each other. And the journey should begin with the Muslims. Muslims have bigger responsibility than others. Muslims have a major responsibility in reaching out to Christians, to Jews, to Buddhists, to Hindus, to all other religions and be active in the, in the interfaith community and interfaith relations. So allow me to mention four points which are very critical, very essential, very important in our relationship with the non-Muslims. Point number one, for those who converted to Islam, the converts, they must maintain good relationship with their families, with their extended families, with their distant families, even with their friends. 
This is called Silatul Rahim, family kinship. Connecting with one's, with one's family. Deepening, strengthening your ties with your family members, especially your parents, your siblings, your cousins, your aunts and uncles. If you convert to Islam, it does not mean that you abandon your family. This is your roots. Whether they are accepting you or rejecting you, it doesn't matter. Same thing goes for those who accept the school of Ahlul Bayt. Do not abandon your families. Stay connected with them. Some of them, maybe they don't like you. Some of them are angry at you. Some of them are fearful of you. Some of them, maybe they feel sorry for what you did. They think that you are going down, you know, down the drain. You are lost. Doesn't matter. You have to be wiser and more compassionate. This is the essence of our religion. A person comes to Imam al-Sadiq and says, I converted to your tradition, to the school of Ahlul Bayt. What do you advise me? I have family. I have a mother. Imam says to him, go back to your family and try to serve them even more, more than the past. Because now you have entered a tradition, a school, a way of life that values the family, values humanity, values mankind, values love and affection for all. Let me read for you a hadith which is mentioned in Al-Kafi. But also the book of Bihar al-Anwar mentions the hadith. This book, Bihar al-Anwar, is an encyclopedia made of 110 volumes. I have it behind me on the shelves. 110 volumes written by a, a great scholar by the name of Al-Allama Muhammad Baqir al-Majlisi who died, who died exactly... 331 years ago tonight Ramadan the eve of the third of Ramadan which is tonight this is the eve of the third is his anniversary his 331 years anniversary because he died the eve of third of Ramadan year 1111 Hijri in the city of Isfahan and this year is 1442 so this is about 330 years ago corresponds with 1699 CE. So this man has an encyclopedia of hadith. He gathered the hadith of the Prophet and the school of Ahlul Bayt in 110 volumes. Can you imagine? On a day where there are no computers, no technology, no electricity, no typewriters, he did this a great work over 330 years ago. So he comes here. He says, someone, عن الجهم ibn Hamid. قلت لأبي عبد الله. He comes to Imam al-Sadiq. A man comes to the sixth Imam. And he says to him, يكون لي القراب على غير أمري. ألهم علي حق? Sometimes I have relatives who are non-Muslims. Maybe extended distant family members who are not non-Muslims. So do they have right upon me or should I sever my rights with them? The Imam answers him, قَالَ نَعَمْ Indeed they have right upon you. حَقُّ الرَّحِمِ لَا يَقْطَعُهُ شَيْءٍ The right of the family cannot be terminated, cannot be abandoned, cannot be neglected. Those are your family, your relatives. Even if you convert to Islam, you may still connect with them, greet them, ask about them, visit them. وَإِذَا كَانُوا عَلَىٰ أَمْرِكْ And if they convert to Islam or they become like you, Muslim or the follower of Ahlul Bayt, كَانَ لَهُمْ حَقَّانِ In this case, they're going to have two types of rights upon you. One of them, حَقُّ الرَّحِمْ The right of the family ties. The second, وَحَقُّ الْإِسْلَامِ the right of sharing the faith with you. And then Alam al-Majlisi in his book, this is his commentary. He says, يَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الْكُفْرَ لَا يُسْقِطُ حَقَّ الرَّحِمْ This means, this story, this hadith means that if you have 
disbelievers among your family members, you still have to connect with them because the right of family is not going to be forfeit. It's not going to be forfeit. You cannot give up on it. They are your family. Keep your goodness and kindness and generosity with them. Keep your relationship with them. Some of them maybe would be harsh with you. Maybe they misunderstand you. Maybe they're going to slander you too. It's okay. It's okay. You have to be patient. You have to be steadfast. Because at the end, you're going to win. You're going to win. You are not doing something wrong. People misunderstand you. Otherwise, you are not doing something wrong. And this misunderstanding, it could take several years. Several years. No one was misunderstood like Prophet Muhammad in Mecca. His entire tribe, his entire family turned against him. In Mecca, he had only two loyal friends, two defenders. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the young man who was raised by Muhammad, his first cousin, and the second one, his loyal wife Khadija, who stood with him despite the boycott of Quraysh. Women of Quraysh said to her, you are not one of us. We are not going to talk to you because you married this man, Muhammad. He's an orphan, he's poor, and now he claims to be the messenger of God. She didn't care because she puts the truth above everything else. But yet she would connect with her family, though they did not want to, but you still have to reach out to them. My friends, nothing, nothing would attract others to Islam like good manners, like humility, like good akhlaq. So try to keep this, try to maintain your akhlaq, especially with your family members. If you have, if you happen to have in your family some people who are atheists, non-Muslims, non-believers, non-practicing, still, still, because they are your blood, your family, your DNA, still you have to be kind to them. Be forgiving, be tolerant. Try to understand them. Try to pray for their guidance. Don't turn against them. Don't. This is a mistake. Don't give up on your family. Even if they don't want to share anything with you, it's okay. It's okay. I sometimes say to some converts who have a problem with their families, they say, we can't pray at home. I say, you don't have to pray at home. Go lock yourself up somewhere else. Sometimes delay your prayers so they don't see you. So you do not provoke them because they misunderstand you. It takes time. But through your good manners and patience, slowly, 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 you're going to attract them to the faith of God, to recognizing God, to respecting Islam. I remember a story, my friends. This happened in England. I was living there. I read it in the Times, the English newspaper, the British newspaper, the famous paper Times, the Times, that the highest judge in England, the highest judge of the Supreme Court, I don't know whether they call it the High Court or Supreme Court, something like that, his son and his daughter converted to Islam. Can you imagine? Rich, white, English, Church of England, influential family. And this is 30 years ago, even more than 30 years ago. Something happened. I don't want to share the entire story with you. Something happened that made them, prompted them to convert to Islam and accept Islam. So the month of Ramadan came. The judge himself says, the highest British judge in the United Kingdom, he said, for the sake of my son and my daughter, we abstained from eating and drinking during the days of Ramadan. 
respecting my son and my daughter who converted to Islam. See, my friends, this has great value. And this happens only when you are patient. Only when you deal with your parents, your relatives, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins with goodness. Don't disconnect with them. Don't just disappear from the radar and say, I am now, alhamdulillah, I'm Muslim, I'm different, I'm a cleaner, I'm wiser. Don't say that. This is your family. And you have to be patient on their wrongdoings and their mistakes and their sins. Be patient. If you are patient, they're going to understand you in the future. So this is number one. This is number one critical point in interacting with non-Muslims. The second point, my friends, is that to try to pray and perform our salat, our prayers in a synagogue, in a church, wherever you travel. Whenever you travel, Mosques are not always available, but if there is a church and if they allow you, go and do your prayers, but in a nice way. Don't scream. Don't stand and raise the adhan and scream and disturb the peace. Don't do that. Respect their environment. Respect their church. Get a permission from them and stand aside and do your prayers politely and silently without harassing anyone. Why? Because God says these are temples, places of worship. And God doesn't mention them in the Quran. Praying there does not mean we agree with their faith, with the tenets of their faith. When I pray at a church, it does not mean I agree with the concept of a trinity. No, it doesn't in any way. But it means I respect this place because it was established for the purpose of worshiping God. Even if we believe that God, God is different, their God is different than our God, which is not. It's not different. It's not different. It's the same God. But it's still these differences should not prevent me from praying in their mosques or even allowing them uh, in their churches and or even allowing them to come to our mosques and perform their rituals in our mosques as the Prophet did himself. The Prophet received the delegation of the Christians of Najran in his mosque in Medina. They came wearing the cross and they did their rituals, their prayers inside the mosque of the Prophet in Medina. And the Prophet was there. And he did not forbid them. He did not scream and shout, Oh, haram, don't do this. So you may do your prayers in a synagogue, in a church, or in other temples. That will get people closer. I remember in past Ramadans, before COVID-19, we used to do interfaith gatherings. And I've done it during Ramadan. I've done the Maghrib prayers in a Mormon church, in a Catholic church, in a Christian church, in a Jewish synagogue. And some people were praying behind me. We, we prayed together. Places of worship are respected. It should not be desecrated it should not be demolished. But unfortunately, we see some governments, like the government of Bahrain, the government of Saudi Arabia, demolished Shia mosques. Over 20 mosques in Bahrain were demolished just because they are Shia mosques. Many other mosques in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia were demolished by the Saudi regimes in the past just because they are Shia mosques. Mosques in Iraq and Syria were demolished by ISIS, Al-Qaeda, because they are Shia mosques. Plus what Saddam Hussein did in the past to Shia mosques in Iraq. They were bulldozed. They were completely demol demolished. God says a mosque, whether it's Shia or Sunni or Sufi or Christian church or a Jewish synagogue or a Hindu temple, these are respected. Or a Buddhist temple, 
places of worship. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Don't desecrate. Don't disrespect these places. Leave them alone. God guarantees freedom of religion for all. It doesn't mean we, we definitely agree with their religion. No. But we have to give them the freedom of worshiping. But then we stand before God on the day of judgment and He is the judge. We are not the judges. We should not judge others. God is the judge. Yes, speak about your religion with respect, with honor, with a pride, but don't impose it on others. And don't go to others and tell them, you are, you know, damned. You are people of hellfire. You are people who are misguided. Don't say these things. They destroy relationships. They create wars. We should stay away from wars, from hate. We need peace nowadays. More than anything else, we need peaceful coexistence, coexistence between religions. Unless we respect each other, we cannot achieve this peace. Let me show you something amazing, my friends. This is Kitab al-Tahdeeb. This is one of the four sources of hadith in the school of Ahl al-Bayt. The first one, Kafi. The second one, Faqihu man la yahdhuruhu al -faqih. The third one is this, Tahdeeb al-Ahkam. The fourth, Al-Istibsar. Tahdeeb al-Ahkam plus Al-Istibsar are written by a gigantic man. His name is al Shaykh al-Tusi, Shaykh al-Ta'ifa, died 982 years ago in the city of Najaf, and he's buried in Najaf. But he was born in Khurasan, in Tus. This is why his last name is Tusi. At the age of 23, he moved from Tus to Baghdad, and then from Baghdad to Najaf, and he established the very first Shia Islamic seminary in the city of Najaf over a thousand years ago. So one of his books is this, Tahdeeb al -Ahkam. Let me show you something very interesting about the churches and the praying in the churches. Someone comes to Imam al-Sadiq and says, asks him, وَسَأَلَ عَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فِي الْبِيَعِ وَالْكَنَائِسِ He asked the Imam, are we allowed to perform our daily prayers in synagogues, bi'a, synagogues, and kana'is churches. فَقَالَ صَلِّ فِيهَا The Imam said to him, yes, perform your prayers if it happened that you are passing by a church or a synagogue and the time of the daily prayers arrives. Go inside and ask permission, of course. And you may perform your prayers, your Islamic prayers, in a Jewish synagogue, in a Christian church. صَلِّ فِيهَا And then the Imam says something amazing, my friends. قَدْ رَأَيْتُهَا مَا أَنْظَفَهَا I have seen the churches, how beautiful they are. Imam says, how beautiful they are. This is 1300 years ago. Imam, Imam al-Sadiq who lived in Medina, he said, yes, I have seen synagogues and churches. How beautiful they are. أَنْظَفَهَا How clean they are. Which is true. I get impressed when I visit any church, whether it's in North America or Europe, because it is quiet, it's clean, it's serene. We have to learn, the Muslims have to, to learn to make our mosques spiritually beautiful, enriched, also physically. The mosque has to be clean, smells good, looks good, the environment is good. God says, take care of places of worship. Only those who believe in God and the Day of Judgment, they will build, maintain, and keep nice and tidy the mosques of God. We must learn that. So Imam al-Sadiq is impressed with the church. Doesn't mean that he's inclined to Christianity, he supports Christianity, no. But he says this place is cute, is clean. You may perform your prayers in that place. So my friends, that was the second point. The first point is that reach out 
to your family members if they are non-Muslims. Maintain good relationship with them. Don't be brainwashed by some fanatic Muslims who tell you that when you convert to Islam, don't speak with your family members. Don't listen to them. This is not the truth. In fact, you have to connect even more and more with your non-Muslim families. So you might be able to attract them eventually into the right path. The second point, if the time of the prayers come, go if there is no mosque, but there is a church, there is a synagogue, and you can find a spot where you do not impose anything on others, seek permission, do your prayers there, because that will increase the interfaith understanding that will deepen the interfaith respect between the followers of different religions. We come to the third point. The third point is that if you have a neighbor, and we all have neighbors who are non-Muslims, try to maintain good relationship with them, good friendship with them, establish relationship with them, reach out to them. And if you happen to travel with a non-Muslim person, even though you don't know him, you may usher him and escort him few steps, few steps. Let me show you a story what Imam Ali did to someone who was a Christian in Kufa. And Imam Ali was the, the leader at that time. He was the caliph. This story is mentioned in Usul al-Kafi. This is the first book of the books of hadith of the school of Ahl al-Bayt written by a Sheikh Muhammad ibn Ya'qub al-Kulayni who is buried in Baghdad in year 329 Hijri, over a thousand years ago. See what he says, the story that he says. Imam al-Sadiq says, إن أمير المؤمنين صاحب رجلا ذميا إمام علي عليه السلام when he was caliph in the city of Kufa one day when he was outside the city in the outer skirt of the city accompanied a person who was non-Muslim most likely was a Christian because there were many Christian tribes in Kufa and the surroundings فقال له الذمي أين تريد يا عبد الله he did not recognize Imam Ali he did not recognize this is the head of the state this is the caliph so he asked him where is your destination فقال أريد الكوفة Imam Ali answered him my destination is كوفة فلما عدل الطريق بالذمي عدل معه أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام فقال له الذمي ألست زعمت أنك تريد الكوفة when the direction changed and Imam Ali changed his direction too. He did not go to the direction of Kufa. He went into another direction. So the man said to him, didn't you tell me that your destination is Kufa? Imam Ali said, yes, I did. He said, but this is not the destination for Kufa. This goes to Basra. Why you are coming to the direction of Basra? Imam Ali said to him, هذا من تمام حسن الصحبة أن يشيع الرجل صاحبه هنيهة إذا فارقه كذلك أمرنا نبينا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. Imam Ali says to this man that this is part of the companionship in the trip. The integration of the companionship, the beautiful companionship. Our Prophet commanded us when we befriend some people during a trip, then we walk, we usher them into their direction. We escort them into their direction for a few steps as a gesture of affection and respect and care. The man was bewildered. He was bewildered. 
Nobody at that time would waste his time and walk with you into your direction while he's going into another direction. So the man said to him, فَقَالَ لَهُ هَكَذَا قَالْ Is this what your prophet said to you? Imam Ali answered him, نَعَمْ Indeed. فَقَالَ الذِّمِّي The non-Muslim said to Imam Ali, لا جرم إنما تبعه من تبعه لأفعاله لأفعاله الكريمة. Then I'm not surprised how people followed your Prophet Muhammad. Now I know that they followed him because of his good manners. Good manners. فأنا أشهدك أني على دينك. Then he immediately says to Imam Ali, Now I hold you as a witness that I am following your religion, meaning the religion of Islam. He changed his direction. He was going to Basra. He changed his direction and he went back with Imam Ali to Kufa. Until that moment, he did not recognize who Imam Ali was. Until he reached the city of Kufa, when he reached the city of Kufa, he saw people greeting Imam Ali, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamu alaykum, O oh, our caliphs. Then he realized, wow, this man then, the commander. Look at Imam Ali, he didn't even tell him about himself. He didn't tell him, listen, but I am the commander. Do you know that? I'm the president. He never, he kept it silent. He knew only when he reached Kufa and people started to greeting Imam Ali. Beautiful Islam, beautiful Prophet, beautiful Imam Ali, beautiful household of the Prophet. We must go back to these examples. The Prophet had a, a, a Jewish who was a, a neighbor, sorry, a neighbor who was a Jew. And he visited him. It's written in the, in the books of history in Medina. A Jewish neighbor was visited by the Prophet of Islam. Imam Ali wanted to get some money as a loan to feed his kids. He went to a merchant in Medina by the name of Shamoon, a Jewish merchant. He borrowed money from a Jewish merchant. We must open up. We are not going to lose anything. We are going to benefit. The more you humble yourself. Now, you may ask me, Sayyid, are you marketing Israel? Asking us, because some people will say this, I know. They say Sayyid is propagating for Israel today. No, I'm not propagating for normalization of diplomatic ties with Israel. No, because that type of normalization is called surrenderance, in my opinion. The Israeli prime minister is a criminal, an aggressor. We should not build relationship with aggressors, with the criminals. They are abusing the Palestinians. They are stealing their lands. They are appropriating their homes, demolishing their homes, imprisoning them. There is so much suffering of the Palestinians. We have to draw the attention to it. I am saying we have to build relationship with the nice people, those who are not against you those who don't target you, those who do not declare war against you and your nation and your pe people, then God says it's okay to be friend with them. Let's go to the fourth point. The fourth point in our interaction with the non-Muslims is mentioned in chapter 29, Surah Al-Ankabut, the spider, verse number 46. وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْهُمْ Do not dispute with the people of the book save, save with the most virtuous manner. When you have a debate, a discussion with a non-Muslim, your discussion should be respectful should not be derogatory, should not be polemic, should not be condescending. It should be based on respect, on rationality, on intelligence. 
ولا تجادل أهل الكتاب إلا بالتي هي أحسن save with the best and most virtuous manners إلا الذين ظلموا منهم except those who are wrongdoers like Bibi Netanyahu he's a wrongdoer he's an aggressor he's ظالم he's a murderer He's a convict. So, وَقُولُوا آمَنَّا بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَأُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ وَإِلَاهُنَا وَإِلَاهُكُمْ وَاحِدٌ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ Tell them that we believe in what you have received and what we have received. Our Lord is one Lord. So, when we speak with them, it has to be in an honorable way. Don't be sarcastic. Don't be condescending. Don't attack. Attacking them verbally does not work. Doesn't work. So we have to establish a dialogue with them. And then this dialogue has to be very sensitive, very nice. Mu'addab. We have to have adab. Adab. The most beautiful thing in this life is when we have good manners and we have adab. If we don't open up, if we don't speak with them, how do you expect them to recognize Islam? How do you expect them to know about Islam? The only way to know about Islam is when they have an interaction with a Muslim, Muslim ind individual, Muslim family, Muslim organization. Then they're going to understand and respect our religion. Now, <clears throat> That does not mean we surrender and we give up on the tenets of our religion or we go along and endorse and accept them and accept their religion. No, no, not in any way. You remain good Muslim, firm Muslim. Stand firm on your principles, but don't attack others. I can stand firm on the principles of Ahlul Bayt, on the principles of Islam, but I don't have to attack others. I may show the difference between the schools of thought or between religions but without attacking others there is no need to attack speak the truth clarify the situation tell people what happened because either today my friends let me conclude with this muslims are of two types today either extremist they don't want to open to each other when someone asks about Shia Islam, shh, 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 don't say anything. No, 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 don't let your son know about Shia Islam. Don't let your son know about other religions, okay? Because if you tell them they might, you know, they might embrace that religion, this is wrong. You cannot control your children. If you don't tell them, others are going to tell them. They're going to learn about it from school, from newspaper, from a movie, from a friend, from a neighbor, at college, at university, when they travel. They're going to know it. How long you want to keep them away from that? You can't. So at least let them know about each others. Allow them to know about other religions and other schools of thought. On the other hand, we have some narrow-minded people who curse others. They keep cursing others as if God created none but them. And he created the entire paras paradise only for them. This is wrong too. God created paradise for mankind, not just for your family or your mosque or your village. God created paradise for those who obey Him and understand Him, for those who do not have hate or grudge or jealousy, for those who do not harass any person, for those who live in peace and they seek peace for others Islam is not an exclusive club it's not Prophet Muhammad God says about him وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ so respect others you may be proud of your faith of who you are no 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 problem with that but don't curse others cursing is forbidden is forbidden May Allah bless you all. My friends, let me say uh, something about the vaccine and the vaccination. Many people are asking, is it okay to take 
the vaccine while I'm fasting, yes, it is okay. It would not invalidate your fast. Take the vaccine because it is injected into your muscle, even if it is injected into your vein, which is not in this case, still your fasting is valid, inshallah. It would not invalidate. Even if you have, God forbid, you are taken to the hospital and they put IV for you. Even the IV does not invalidate your fast. May Allah, and you must take the vaccination, my friends. Take it from me. I'm your servant. We must all take the vaccination. We must keep ourselves, our relatives, our communities, our countries, and mankind safe. Yes, God is the healer, but God says there are ways. You must follow these ways, these protocols. If you follow them, I will protect you. So let's act rationally, intellectually, and take the vaccination, inshallah, so we can go back to each other. May Allah protect you, bless you. Allahumma khfar lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Oh Allah, forgive us during this month. Oh Allah, bestow your, your wisdom, your guidance, your affection on us. Allow us to get closer and closer to you. Accept our fast, our Quranic recitation, our supplications, our du'as. Wish you all the best, inshallah. I can say to you during this month, this month allows me the fasting allows me to say I love you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.